Welcome to this edition of Educating Iowa. I'm Trace Pickering. Today we're going to be exploring the history of education to better frame the current conversations we're having around education. We hope you enjoy it. To truly understand education and the course that we've taken over time and to understand its place, you really have to understand the four elements that make up a systems analysis, the ability to understand the system in its entirety and not just the parts and pieces. And those four are context, functions, structures, and processes. And we're going to go through each briefly. Context is really understanding what's going on in the world around us, what's happening in our environment, uh, what's happening to the world, what changes are taking place. Functions is really the question about what is it we're trying to produce? What is it that we're, this, we want this system to make happen for us? Structures, those are how we organize people to do the work. How do we put people together and what combinations in order to realize the purpose or function that we're after to address the context that we find ourselves in? And finally, processes, which are those things, policies, procedures, that undergird the way we organize the people and produce those functions. So these work in a totality. If you don't understand one or more of these elements, you really hinder your ability to understand how the system works and, more importantly, create actions that impact it and can make it change. So we're going to do a quick uh, overview of three distinct periods in our history in America and how they relate to these things. The first is the agrarian America. So the context, agrarian, 1650 to about 1860-ish. Okay? Arguably that time period. America was an agrarian economy, an agrarian nation. Uh, the issues, the context that we faced at that time, uh, we had, were trying to settle the West, we had lots of people, we needed artisans and craftsmen, wheelmakers, blacksmiths, uh, carpenters to help us build our country, and we needed to retain our republic. Our republic was fragile, uh, so we needed uh, learned people who could continue to uh, push our democracy forward and help define that and keep it alive. Well, this means lots of people need a little bit of education and lots of skill in terms of crafts, right? And so you need also a small group of people who can go on to the colleges and, and be kind of book smart, if you will. So that's the context we found ourselves in. So what's the purpose then of an education system in that context? Well, Thomas Jefferson realized the importance of public education and as well as understood that the American system had to provide the poor with an opportunity to, to rise, otherwise we would just reinvent a caste system. And so as he looked out, he, craft, he crafted the vision for education, uh, which is the purpose of education. And in 1784, he said the purpose of education was to rake the genius from the rubbish. Harsh words for our time. But it's exactly, uh, it's in, in the states and the notes of Virginia, 1784. So the purpose became raking the genius from the rubbish. Well, what does Jefferson mean by that? Well, what he wants to do is figure out, of all the poor kids and rich kids, what's the small percentage who are really smart, really fast at learning, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and who can rise to the top and go to the colleges. All the rest of the kids uh, can go become apprentices and artisans and craftsmen and and forge a new world out there with their hands and, and their labor. And so he designed a system to do raking the genius from the rubbish. We call it today sort and select. So how then did he structure his school system to do that? Well, you have one-room schoolhouses. Uh, you have communities that can send their kids there. You bring in a teacher. The kids are in range in age from 4 or 5 to 17 or 18, and they're all together, learning together uh, basic skills, reading, writing, math, and so forth. And so you, you create that kind of structure. At this point in time, it was a completely parent-optional system. Uh, kids did not have to go to school. They didn't, there wasn't any penalty for not going. It was totally a parent choice. The processes that we see then, so we have our one-room schoolhouse here, processes were strictly basic math, basic reading, 
and basic writing. The process was simply to give some kids some education, you know, two, three years worth, and really identify the small percentage of kids who are very gifted, and the system would just continue to engage them and move them through the system. Well, this, this system created, uh, was a perfect school system for the agrarian age. It created, it gave kids opportunities to go to school. It didn't hinder the ability of them to go to apprenticeships and to be involved in their uh, communities and building, uh, doing the work. And it also helped us identify uh, those who happened to have a gift in reading, writing, and or math. And uh, they could matriculate up to the colleges. So it was perfectly suited to the agrarian age. It didn't really matter if you had much of an education. There was plenty of work to do in the community. Well, this lasted, as I said, until about 1860, when all of a sudden we entered the industrial age. And so the industrial age comes with a whole new context to it. 1860 to about 1980, arguably. So the Industrial Age came with a whole new context, as I mentioned. And that context was this. We have mass immigration, mass European immigration. We have a mass migration to cities. And for the first time, we have more people working for somebody else for an hourly wage than we've ever seen before. That was almost unheard of before the Industrial Revolution. And so this context created all kinds of issues. There was, you had to figure out a new way of living. Uh, in these cities and working, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day for somebody for a paycheck. Um, the work was very regimented. Uh, you were basically a machine doing repetitive tasks. It was simplified down for you and so forth. And so this was the context we found ourselves in, right? Well, how does the education respond to that? Well, the good news for this shift in thinking was that Jefferson's vision for education remains viable. It's still to rake the genius from the rubbish, put harshly in his words, it is still a sort and select process. It must produce a handful of people capable of being managers and factory owners, and a whole mass of people able to go to the factories. Right. Well, how does that look structurally? That has to look different now because our context is different. We're no longer an agrarian society. We've got massive numbers of kids in cities. We've got tons of factories opening. Uh, how do we manage that structurally? Well, we organize our school based on the factory model, which at this point in time is showing its dominance and showing how much wealth it can create for a nation. And so, of course, you're going to model your school after the factory. Uh, and also what you need to do is you need to have students who learn to be compliant, learn to follow directions, and learn to deal with monotony. Because the majority of them are going into factories for eight, ten hours a day doing just those things. So, the factory model structure is you come up with age-based grading, you batch kids by their age, you institute tests and grades to evaluate their quality, I find it interesting we call it grades. At this, at this time, they were also doing what we understand with our meat, grade A, meat, and so forth. It's interesting we use the same letters and concepts. Uh, we organized teachers so that they had to do, they didn't have to think too much. Give them a very prescribed curriculum, make them follow a set of directions, just like a factory worker, and minimize the work, simplify it down. So if I was a math teacher, it's likely that I often didn't teach more than one subject of math. I might just teach geometry. I may never teach algebra or calculus, right? And so we built structures in order to mimic the factory, simplify the work, monotonize it, standardize it, make it very efficient. Okay? And we put processes in place to drive that home. Tests, grades, unwavering cycle time. Time became the constant. If you couldn't move through the system and do well on the time that was prescribed, then that selected and sorted you out of the system and encouraged you to move to the factory. Despite the fact we had large numbers of dropouts during this time, it was perfectly fine for the system because those kids had places to go. They could go to John Deere, General Motors, and places like that and get work. So. The function, sorting and selecting, that Jefferson first initiated, fit well with the context, 
but we use our new thinking around factories to design the structures, how we organize people to get the work done and be much more efficient about it. And we use processes to cement in compliance, checking quality at the end, uh, putting them on a timeline so we could more effectively determine who was smart and who wasn't, uh, and so forth. And so we were able to create quite a, uh, quite a positive educational system, um, positive in terms of the economic impact it had on our country. And it was completely viable and compatible with the existing order of the day. And the education system helped create America as the greatest superpower, industrial power, of the world's ever seen. Right? But now we face a very new context, a very different world. We've moved from the industrial age, and it's called a million different things, but for this purpose, we've moved to the information age. Well, what is the context of the information age? Well, menial factory-type jobs are virtually gone. Uh, recent statistics suggest that only 13% of all American jobs have anything to do with manufacturing and that kind of labor. Uh, you have to be highly skilled. You have to understand technology. We have a globally connected world, like it or not. Uh, the, uh, the jobs are not in um, the factory. Automation is taking the place of the menial tasks that workers used to do. We have massive migration. Uh, much like we did at the turn of the uh, last century. Uh, we have movement to the cities, and we have a huge disruption in the way people work because we do, we're do required now to do different work in different settings in different ways. Uh, the big issue is I no longer use my muscles as much as I use my brain. Well, given this world, we have to examine what is the purpose of education to address this new context that we face. Well, certainly Jefferson's vision to rake the genius from the rubbish and sort and select kids out uh, is incompatible with what we need to do today. Uh, we can't sort and select kids out. We need almost we need all of them uh, to be intelligent, thoughtful, creative, innovative, uh, participating in our economy and using their brain uh, much more than they use their bodies. And so I would argue one particular purpose or vision that we might see ourselves now is to unfold the potential of every child. It's no longer good enough to just sort out the ones who get it on a certain timeline that's prescribed much like a factory model. We must unfold the potential. Well, if, if we're going to unfold the potential of every child, what do our structures need to look like? Well, the factory model doesn't seem to be the correct model. Uh, strict compliance to rules, time-bound, batching kids, uh, organizing them by age, simplifying the work down, separating the subjects out, those seem relatively incompatible to unfolding the potential of every child. So structures may very well need to change. Uh, I would argue they do need to change. To what? Well, much more fluid and flexible structures that allow students to progress at their own rates uh, a very different way of organizing teachers. Uh, this notion of one teacher in a classroom of 20 kids and that teacher is responsible for those 20 seems pretty factory modelish. Uh, when we have to teach children how to work in teams and uh, connect with each other and produce new things, uh, it would certainly behoove us to organize our teachers in such a way that they demonstrated those sets of skills. And finally, then, the processes required to unfold the potential of every child really need to change. Uh, testing kids and determining their content is all well and good, but what we really need to focus on process-wise is where are children today, what are their passion areas, and how do we move them to the next step at their pace? Um, not laissez-faire and hope they get it, but encouraging, uh, motivating and moving them forward, but at their own pace and not at artificial timelines. A quick example to share with you of how this might work. Uh, my freshman daughter, two years ago, uh, her desire was to be a New York City chef. If we had a school system that unfolded her potential, that school system would have had a way of connecting her with other kids with similar interests and teaching her math and science and reading and economy, uh, health, all through her love of cooking. 
think about the science application of understanding the interplay of flavors and spices and ingredients and the mathematics required, the geometry, the, uh, the fractions and, and, and so forth, the writing about uh, what it meant to be a chef, blogging, uh, reading about what it takes to open a restaurant, uh, building a business plan, uh, actually producing uh, goods and, and selling them and, and so forth, right? The new school system would have allowed her to take that passion, self-paced way, and the teacher's job then would become, how do we provide Shelby with the skills and the knowledge she really needs using the vehicle of cooking? Uh, now, of course, as a 14-year-old, she's losing interest in being a chef. The point is not trying to help her become a chef. It's pursuing, helping her connect to the passions that she has at the time to bigger, deeper learning. And so as she moves to the next thing she's interested in, forensics or law or so forth, the system would allow her to pursue those passions and ensure that she got the skills at the same time which is much different than the earlier functions of, hey, we're going to teach you what we think you need to know. If you can figure it out, you get to stay, and if not, you get to go. Well, understanding context, function, structures, and processes is critical to our understanding our education system and engaging in conversation. But we have to understand these four and how they interplay. Because if we continue to just argue and have conversations about improving the system we have by changing the structures and the processes without understanding their implications on a new function that we're after to address a new world that we face, we are going to continue to suffer failure and frustration and, quite honestly, a very expensive system. I'm Trace Pickering. This has been Educating Iowa. Thanks for joining us.